these children in Pakistan don't go to school. They and another 22.8 million like them are denied their fundamental right, a quality education. The Citizens Foundation was set up in 1995 to bring about a positive social change through education of the less privileged. DCF is on track to impact the lives of two million individuals by giving them the opportunity to dream and build a better future. The Citizens Foundation UK is the fundraising partner of DCF. Together, we can help solve this large-scale problem, educating these children to become responsible citizens of our world. Your zakat and donations can help them dream big. It's in your hands. Please donate £9 per month to change a life today. Well, every, uh, hello everyone. This is uh, Dr. Salman Ahmed, and I welcome you to TCF's Keeper Dream Alive event. I think we have a great show lined up for you, and uh, it's it's uh, and, and and the objective is to to highlight to you and focus to you the great work Citizen Foundation is doing. But before that, let me give you a little bit of a context on the work. And of course, the challenge, the severe challenge, uh, which Pakistan faces in the education sector with 22 million children out of school and, and the unique and the very important role of the Citizen Foundation in addressing that challenge. And, and it's, it's an it's a existent, existential challenge for as far as I'm concerned. And I've been interacting and, uh, and, and working and supporting TCF for the last six years and it has been an ultimate pleasure and privilege of mine to work very closely with them as they try to address this important and a, and a very critical challenge facing Pakistan. Uh, we'll discuss uh, TCF a little bit more shortly. And I have Mr. Mushtaq Chapra with me, who is going to be joining us very, very soon. He is the co-founder of TCF, the Citizen Foundation. He is the recipient of Sitara Imtiaz, and which is the star of excellence, which is one of the highest civilian honors conferred upon an individual by the president of Pakistan. And in fact, he has played a critical and a central role in terms of bringing TCF to where it is right now over the last 25 years. And then after a brief Q&A with Mr. Mashtar Chapra, I would hand over to the main segment we have got lined up for you, which is Owen Bennett Jones in conversation with Michelle Hussain. Uh, Owen is an award-winning journalist and a reporter, and Michelle is the broadcaster and presenter of Radio 4's Today program and the news on BBC. Overall, we are truly grateful for all of you to join us today and giving us your time. And thank you very much once again for investing your time today with us uh, as we put this spotlight on one of the most important challenges facing Pakistan, which is education. And in fact, equally important, the role TCF is playing in addressing that challenge. So, so without further ado, let me welcome Mr. Mushtaq Chapra to our broadcast. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Asalaamu Wa alaikum salam and thank you uh, for having me on the broadcast. Thank How are things in uh, London? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Mishtaq Saab. Me personally and for, uh, for, uh, for all our audience that you have joined us. Uh, I thought uh, we could take this opportunity to ask you a few questions about TCF and also the work uh, you're doing, uh, obviously, in addressing the key critical challenge of education in Pakistan. Uh, so let me start with the first question. In your view, what makes TCF unique in the way 
it's addressing the severe education challenge in Pakistan? And what are the key highlights of your strategy and of your implementation would you like to share with us today? Uh, uh, thank you, Salman. It's, uh, it's uh, I, uh, on the spot, you know, uh, the uh, TCF uh, schooling system is a totally uh, uh, unique system when the founders decided to uh, bring a, a qualitative change into the uh, education scenario of Pakistan. Um, it was it was thought that we should build a organization which would have uh, which was build um, and manage schools all over the country. It wouldn't be a schooling system for Lahore or Karachi or Islamabad, but it would be a system which would be uh, in every village and every slum of Pakistan. Now the uniqueness of the uh, TCF system is that we want to make it into a neighborhood activity, which means that we take the school to the kids rather than bringing the children out of their uh, villages. And this has become the most powerful uh, uh, thing for, for uh, the parents and the kids because it's a secure environment. The children walk to the schools. It is becoming a community uh, center rather than uh, just a schooling system. Secondly, uh, the, the curriculum has been improvised and adapted in such a manner that it gives a chance for the children to have uh, uh, critical uh, thinking into, into the education. It's just not rote learning of sorts, like, like it's done in most of the... Uh, and the third part is that the accessibility for the girl child is, uh, is comfortable because we have only female faculty. We only employ educated uh, girls uh, who are teachers and principals. Thus, it is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's comfortable for the parents to send the girls to our schools. And lastly, we have a very focused uh, teacher training program. This teacher training program is unique and makes uh, you know, the, the, the teacher, um, you know, uh, every, every three to six months, there's a refresher and there are developmental training programs. And uh, of course, not, not in COVID times, but in, in normal times, uh, there have been uh, uh, people coming over from overseas, uh, um, you know, managing workshops for the teacher. So these are some of the salient features which make uh, uh, the TCF program truly a different program, truly a focused program. And that is the reason the kids coming out of the system are, are incredible. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Aksa. That was a uh, 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 very detailed, uh, uh, you know, points you mentioned, especially uh, the fact that you know the schools are being uh, being shifted to very close to the children, and the fact that they are integrated with the communities. I think it's a very important point in terms of as you are amplifying. Uh, the impact. Uh, second question I'm going to ask you, Mr. Taksab, is is of course uh, 2020 is the year of COVID, and it will always be rem remembered as the year of the pandemic. But it has added to another another layer of challenge to your work, um, with of course uh, uh, a developing country like Pakistan with limited resources, and 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 of course the the challenge of education is no uh, has always been very critical and and very strong. Well, how are you, uh, you know, how is TCF being impacted and, and what are the new ways you're thinking about as you make sure that, uh, you know, uh, children remain connected uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with the education streams uh, which TCF is, uh, uh, is, is deploying? Um, as we all know that COVID-19 uh, uh, has thrown uh, everybody off guard and the world is trying to understand and fight this pandemic. Pakistan, we have a whole lot of issues. Uh, the uh, Obviously, the schools uh, were shut down and the children were uh, in their homes with uh, meager means of livelihood. Their parents, mother and father, were daily wage earners. They don't have any jobs. So the first thing TCF did was to uh, 
immediately create a three-point plan where uh, TCS provided cash subsidies and food uh, rations uh, for the uh, for the communities around the TCS schools, irrespective of whether the children they are the parents of the children studying in TCF schools or the the total community was looked after for for almost months, you know, by a, a special fund which was created. Secondly, uh, during the pandemic. Our volunteers, the alumni, the, the, the boys and girls who have come out of the PCF system and the teachers went out assisting the frontline health workers in, in sort of implementing not only the SOPs for COVID, but also distribution of masks, uh, face shields, and, and in times uh, also clothing because there were, there were emergencies where uh, the... the, the uh, the community had to be attended medically. And lastly, you very correctly pointed out, to keep a connectivity uh, or the connection with the kids, the school was, schools were closed. So they created and prepared a special workbook because one has to understand, one has to understand that in Pakistan, uh, not every locality is connected with, with uh, internet connectivity. And uh, uh, the problem is that uh, a large number of TCF schools are in, in places where there is hardly any internet available. So wherever internet was available, we had a digital learning program in place uh, for these kids. We, we also uh, launched the, uh, in partnership with the government of Pakistan, a t television uh, education television program. Uh, which was known as Ilm Kang Angan, you know, uh, 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 and that that also was a, a very huge success for kids who had accessibility to television. And, but otherwise, the teachers and the volunteers prepared workbooks, which the workbooks were taken to the homes of those kids, and uh, uh, the kids uh, filled in those workbooks, and every week or every two weeks the workbooks were exchanged with new new so that way it was a very interesting sort of a, a during the days where the schools were closed down there was a, a not a total disconnect for the kids there was an activity an ongoing activity with the kids thank you mr Aksab. i guess it's an example of resilience and innovation as challenges come through uh, you have to innovate and, and make sure that we are, uh, you know, uh, focused on our core objectives. So thank you for sharing those details. I think uh, they make a lot of sense. And I would emphasize your point that uh, we forget sitting uh, sitting in London and New York or other places that Pakistan's Wi-Fi coverage is not as uniform uh, and, and, and it needs uh, a different kind of solution, uh, uh, which, which you talked about. So... Mustaksa, and with the third question, uh, if there is one message, if you could give to everyone uh, listening right now, based on your journey in life and based on 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 your journey with TCF, what would that be? Uh, uh, and we would love to hear that uh, from you. Uh, first of all, I need to thank all my uh, supporters, the TCF supporters in the UK, especially, and those who are hearing me tonight. But I, I'm sorry, it's night in Pakistan, but in in in, in the UK, um, I think I think that the message of TCF is uh, absolutely uh, clear, and we have proven in the last 25 years that if you need to change the destiny of a country, you have to educate the children of that country. TCF is, I I, don't, I we don't call it anymore a a, a sort of a a, a, it's a, it's not even a, it's not a movement anymore. It's a it's a it's a revolution coming out of Pakistan that we are reaching out to at least two to three million, two to three million uh, uh, people, uh, the children who study in in so any economic empowerment to be created in a country you have to have the children educated. And I wish and I want to tell you that we have just started on this crusade and we would like the support of every individual, every person who can, through 
obviously through money, through, through uh, talking about this good work, sharing the experiences all over. Thank you very much, Mushtaq Saab. That was wonderful. And I really appreciate, uh, and I think we, all of us really appreciate your insights and, and your views and your thinking and, and your message. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, as someone who has been involved with TCS over the last several years, uh, I think it's an organization which uh, is, is thoroughly professional, focused uh, on its goals. And, and, and I, can, I can personally vouch for that, having first, uh, first-hand experience in terms of the impact uh, your work is, is, is having. And, and, and you should be proud of it. And we as Pakistanis are certainly proud of the work you're doing uh, with TCF in educating our uh, future generations. So thank you very much as well from all of us here as well uh, by making this public uh, uh, you know, objective at the top of your mind and at the top of your execution. So thank you once again. Uh, um, I guess uh, a little bit of a message for all of uh, you guys who are listening, you can have, you know, you can learn more about TCF by visiting their website and their YouTube channel. And of course, uh, please don't forget, uh, we have the full technology here for you. You have the QR code, uh, which uh, you can use to, to do any donations as well. So, so, uh, so, you know, make use of all the tools which are available to you at this moment in time. So let me now uh, move over to the next segment, uh, which is Owen Bennett-Jones in conversation with Michelle Hassan. Uh, and we will be monitoring questions uh, in the, uh, on the sidelines and, as, and keep those questions coming as we feed into our two main, uh, main uh, stars of, of the show. So over to you, Owen and, and Michelle. Thank you very much, Salman. Um, and good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. It's, I've been a TCF supporter for many years now. I was introduced by one of my cousins more than 10 years ago. Um, it's a wonderful organization. And to anyone who's logged on to this and who's new to their work, I strongly advise you to take the opportunity to find out as much as possible um, about them. It's a real pleasure to be uh, on this with you, Owen. Hello. Hi there. Hi there. Um, very well. And I was, of course, thinking that it was Reporting Pakistan that first brought you and me together because it was in 1999, uh, at the height of the Kargil crisis, when the BBC sent me over from the newsroom in London to um, to help you out with everything um, that the Islamabad Bureau was dealing with it. And um, I remember lots about that trip, not least because sometime during that trip, I knew that you had fully acclimatised to Pakistan when you said... Um, there was another young journalist who was over covering the same story. And you said, what about you and him in a very matchmaking way? And I was like, this man has got far too used to Pakistan already. So, um, so anyway, we have a long association. This is your new book. Um, so I think the Bhuttos would be a big part of uh, what we talk about this evening. Um, Let's start right there. And I'm going to remind everyone that if you look at the comment section of this platform, then you will be able to see exactly how to put your question. Um, however you're watching, you'll be able to put your question into the feed and we'll see it here. So hopefully Owen will be answering lots of your questions as well as mine. So um, Owen, let's start with the Bhuttos. And you start the book uh, with the terrible events of um, December 2007 and the assassination of Benazir Bhutto. But let's go further back to Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto and his early life because um, there was an aspect of his early life that was new to me and that I think you explain in the book is really important to, the, to his character, which is the story of his mother. I think lots of people probably know about the Bhutto, um, you know, and, and, their, and their, their situation in Sindh and their lands and all the rest of it. The story of his mother is rather more complicated. Yes, I'm just to say right at the beginning, I had quite a lot of difficulty hearing you, but I, I just about got that. So, but if uh, some questions I can't understand, you may have to repeat. Uh, so, yes, I mean, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto's mother was a key uh, part of his life, really, a driving force of his life, in the sense that her background was extremely unusual. Her, his father, Sashar Nawaz, had a wife uh, from the Bhutto family in a traditional manner to keep the lands within the family. Uh, he then married again a much younger woman who was a Hindu before. Uh, she converted just before the uh, marriage and uh, uh, was, it is said, a dancing girl. And many of the Bhutto family rejected uh, his mother as a legitimate member of the family. And Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto was always fighting against it. 
and he felt very strongly about this. He came up throughout his life from time to time. He would talk about this, and uh, many people who are close to him think that uh, his mother's history was something that drove him on and that made him want to prove himself and really was the source of some of his ambition. And so it was something he talked about. He said it gave him great sympathy for the poor, that his mother uh, had experience of poverty and that he therefore was more sympathetic to the poor, that he was more sympathetic to minorities, that he was more sympathetic to people who were outside his normal feudal background, if you like. So Zulfrak Alibuse directly credited her with a lot of his politics. But you also write in the book that you think that seeing the rejection of his mother by some members of the family had an influence on him, that his energy and personal drive arose partly out of his need to prove himself. I just can't hear you, Michelle. I'm sorry, I just can't get it. No, I can't hear you terribly well either, actually. You're really, really crackly for some reason. I don't know if anyone else can, um, can hear about that. No, just, just that beyond the effect on his politics, there was all you write about how it had an effect on a need that he had to prove himself. There was something of a complex. I, I, I can't hear you, Michelle. I can't hear you. Oh, gosh. Okay. I'm going to reconnect. I'm going to reconnect. Okay, well, Owen's going to um, hopefully dial back in, and hopefully that will be, but that will be better. Salman, are you still with us? I'm wondering who else is still um, still on the call. Yeah, I think you might be on mute, Salman. Hopefully, mm, try again. I still think you're you're muted. Yes, I think I'll be okay now. Okay, maybe we can actually just share a little bit more about about TTF because I was really keen to get up to speed before this about the effect of the pandemic on education in Pakistan, and you must be very worried about the um, about how about the effect that this kind of disruption has on children's learning loss. Yes, uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, obviously the pandemic has been uh, has been very very uh, disruptive for all of us. I don't know if I. Moving my camera a little bit better, yes. So disruptive for all of us, but especially for the children and and and, and those in, in in schools. I think the critical one is the point I can mention is that uh, is that as Mustaqsa was talking about, is that Pakistan's challenges are actually quite unique, and especially with an developing country perspective. So this Wi-Fi online learning angle. Uh, even though it's cheap and may not require that much resources, actually may not work in Pakistan. So that means that we need to actually help even more get because the schools really have to connect with the children to keep them engaged. That's the only point I guess I would highlight. Yeah. That the solution will have to be different. And and I guess, yeah, I think people who can really relate to that because we've all seen how hard that can be for children, even in the most advanced um, society. So Owen is now back. Owen, can you hear me any better now? Not really, but give it a go. Okay, I can hear you slightly better, although there's a very funny crackling on the line. Um, how is it now? Still a bit dodgy. Okay, yes, no, I was asking about the um, effect on Kripikov's personality of, of um, you know, seeing the way his mother was treated in early life. Well, I mean, there's a number, yeah, one of the features of uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto's personality was that he, he was quite vengeful. And that was a feature of his character really through, through, through his life, but particularly perhaps when he was in power towards the end. Uh, but he could not bear a slight and uh, he would always pay it back. And, you know, I think probably that has more to do with his feudal Cindy background than it does with his mum. I think his mother gave him ambition and gave him the idea, it gave him some of his politics, the politics of the poor, the politics of poverty, but it also gave him an ambition to prove that he was uh, as good as any other member of the family, that he was a legitimate member of the family, that he was uh, a, a personality he could rank with the best of the family, if you like. How early on in your connection with Pakistan did you think about writing this book? What was the moment when you thought you wanted to do this? Well, I had it in mind for some time, but I guess, I guess when... Um, Benazir Bhutto was assassinated. Uh, I did think that um, you know, she had a story, and I've been thinking about writing about her, really, more than the dynasty. But then having started thinking about writing about her and gathering some of that material, I just thought that 
it would be a better way of approaching it to do the whole story of the family because it is a good way of telling Pakistan's story in a way. I mean, they're only one family, but they are a very important family. And they had this experience in the colonial period. They then went through all the phases of Pakistan as they you know, struggled for power uh, and, and now are still relevant. I mean, Bilal Bhutto may, may make it as, as the fourth member of this generation of the family to, to actually win power. So they are, you know, obviously uh, interesting as well in as much as there's so much drama in, in their yeah. family story. I mean, you know, there's tragedy with the hanging and the Shah Nawaz being poisoned and Mursala being shot and Benazir being assassinated. I mean, there's just so much uh, drama in their d dynastic story that it seemed to me rich material. Yes, and and also as you say, the story of Pakistan and particularly all the turbulence, well, turbulence throughout. But I'm particularly thinking about the very, that very dramatic period in the 1960s and early 1970s. So uh, coinciding with Bhutto's meteoric rise and then his um, and then his time leaving the country. So let's talk a bit about the relationships between the generations. So Benazir and her siblings. What was what, was she the natural heir or was it circumstances? Well, it was, it was circumstances, I think, to, to, to a degree. I mean, there was a contest, I mean, let's face it, but between, between Mertesa and her. Mertesa felt, towards, especially towards the end of his life, he was the legitimate uh, leader of Pakistan, that he was the proper successor to his father, that he was the eldest son and therefore uh, should be the one. And uh, his mother agreed to that. You know, uh, there was a phase when Nusrat Bhutto quite plainly took Murtis aside in the dispute between the two siblings. Uh, so, no, it wasn't always automatic. And one of the things that I learned researching the book was just how hard Benazir worked to take control. Uh, there's a fascinating letter I got hold of which uh, described how she uh, was faced with a situation where she was in London and her mother was still important in the party, but she was trying to assert herself. And she found that decisions were being taken by the PPP leadership in Pakistan without any reference to her in London. Uh, so she wrote a letter to her true loyalist on the executive of the Pakistan People's Party and said to them, look, what I need you to do is on any issue, find a point of disagreement. I do not want to be told that a unanimous decision has been taken. I don't care what position you take, but find a point of disagreement, disagree, split the decision and make sure it's referred to me so that I have the final word on any decision. So it's that kind of quite uh, Machiavellian manoeuvring that enabled her to assert herself and eventually dominate the Pakistan People's Party. And was was she driven by a feeling that she had been in Pakistan, um, you know, at her father's side as close to the end as they, as they could when he was imprisoned? that she'd been imprisoned herself? Or was it a sense of, you know, what she saw as the, as the, as the difficulties or inadequacies of her brothers? No, no, I think she thought she, she, she had earned the right, and she had in a sense. I mean, she, she, she stayed in the country and she resisted. She was astonishingly brave, I mean, to the end. It was one of her most uh, striking characteristics. She was just very physically brave and she was, put in prison uh, on some phases in really very, very bad conditions. And she she withstood it. So she was seen by the people of Pakistan to have been tested uh, by this period of, you know, these long periods of imprisonment and uh, you know, constant, if you sort of mean, kept, kept getting put back in jail. Yeah. And and so she 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 did, uh, she, would, she, she, you know, she, she, she sacrificed uh, uh, for the leadership. And her brothers, meanwhile, I mean, it's not their fault, but they were in London, they were in Kabul. They weren't suffering with the Pakistan people in the way that she was. And exiled leaders often find it hard to come back and to relate to the people they've uh, been away from, if you like. Yeah. Now that the sound is much better, I'm going to remind everyone, please uh, do, if you put your questions underneath wherever you're watching, whether it's YouTube or Facebook, then um, I'll, I'll be able to bring them into the conversation with Owen. Owen, speaking of Benazir's courage, you you write very powerfully about the day of, of her assassination and about uh, about her being warned in the middle of the night about the threat to her life that day. It was extraordinary. The head of the ISI came to her at about one o'clock in the morning and said, I have to tell you, you're planning to go to Rawalpindi in a few hours time. There is a plot to kill you. There are people in Rawalpindi who are preparing to kill you. You shouldn't go. 
And she said, you're trying to stop me having a rally. He said, I'm not. I'm telling you, you are at severe risk. And she said, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to back down. So it's your job. You're the head of the ISI. You protect me and you protect my party people. That's your job. My job is to go and speak. So he said, OK, he, he, he said, I don't agree with your decision, but I will try and protect you. Uh, then he, she went to the meeting. And as you know, uh, these two 15 year old boys, uh, astonishing thing that most of the people involved on the plot in the day were all children, really. And this uh, one, two 15 year old boys went there at each entrance. One of them survived and walked away. And he's just been filmed, actually, in Afghanistan. He's quite a senior Taliban leader now. But the other one uh, got to the car, uh, shot her and, and blew himself up. And she did go to her death knowing that she was at risk, at significant risk of being killed. And she was, you know, astonishingly brave about it and, and, and sort of fatalistic and just said, if it comes, it comes and I accept it. But knowing that there was that warning, this is why your description of what happens in the immediate aftermath, I mean, the, the atrocious way that um, her vehicle is just sort of left on its own and they're all, and at one point they're having to uh, try and think about hailing a taxi to get her to the to the hospital. I mean, it's just an a um, it's just an appalling aftermath as well as an appalling act. Well, I mean, it's, it's an indictment of, of two groups of people. First of all, the police who simply disappeared uh, and melted away, um, and then her own party people and her own head of security drove away. I mean, it is inexplicable. Uh, some of the four of her most loyal supporters in that car, uh, they simply drove away. And she was left, and uh, when the car she was in eventually broke down because the tires were shredded, and they were literally in the car trying to get a taxi to get her to the hospital when another Sherry Roman's car, in fact, turned up and was able to take her to the, uh, to the hospital. So I mean, she was totally abandoned in the moment of her death. Do you think, from what you have read, do you think had the response been different, she might, her life might have been saved? No, I, I don't. Actually. Having talked to uh, people in the car, one of whom was a qualified doctor, one of the people actually in the car with her when she was blown up, I, I mean, he didn't want to say it exactly, but I get the impression, actually, she died instantly. Uh, and that all the attempts to revive her were done so as to say that they'd been as thorough as they could have been, but that it was clear she, she couldn't survive it. Um, speaking of um, uh, people you spoke to for the book, what, what was the process like, Owen? Your thoughts is how difficult was it to um, to get the access that you needed? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, not, not entirely easy. I mean, the family are a bit nervous about it, I think, probably. So they'd helped me a lot, the family. With, I did a podcast on the assassination, uh, and they were very helpful about that. But uh, I didn't manage to speak to... Uh, them for the book itself. I mean, some members of the family, I should say, were extremely helpful. Tariq Islam, uh, Sanam Benazir's sister, was very, very helpful. So there were people who were helpful, but there were others, you know, Bilal and Asa Sadari, who didn't talk to me uh, for the book. So in, in a way, it gave me more independence, which, in a sense that, uh, it, it, I mean, I, I, I would have liked to have talked to them, but I was able to manage without. In, in terms of um, the sources, yes, I mean, you know, there is, it is a, probably quite a good time to be doing it in that um, she died long enough ago for people to be quite open about their memories of her and without sort of feeling they have to be party loyalists to her in the way that when she was alive, if you like, because, uh, you know, no longer is she is she there. So so I, I think it was yeah about the right time to do it and to try and make some sort of assessment of her life. OK, I'm going to bring the first of our questions from the um, audience. This one is from uh, Bakar Khan, who asked, Owen, do you think that Benazir Bhutto's political career was handicapped by her husband's role, both in politics and outside? Uh, well, she and her husband worked together, we have to remember. So uh, the whole story of uh, the financial stuff and the, the corruption allegations go back to her first government. And one of the things I discovered about it, which I hadn't really expected, was that at the beginning, it was all about party funding and it was all about having the money to do politics in Pakistan. And it just simply, in the view, their view, it, it was impossible to do politics when they were up against the bureaucracy, up against the army, unless they had significant resources uh, to do it. Uh, so, there, so there was a, a whole phase of um, 
we, we, of trying to get the party finances in sufficiently good order to be able to basically buy the loyalty of, of the MPs in the party. I mean, to be quite frank about it, the, the members of the National Assembly and others uh, who simply had to be had to be, um, you know, persuaded to keep on supporting the party under severe military pressure not to. So, so that's how it began. And uh, you know, the, the party membership have been hostile to Asif Zadari. There was a phase when she was coming back for the third term, when she wanted to have her third term, that she left him in Dubai. And uh, that was because she was aware that many in the party were not enthusiastic about him. Uh, but, you know, they were close to the end. And I saw them together and they were genuinely close uh, right to the end of, of, of her life. And, and you know, Asif Zadari in that sense was her true uh, heir and that she named him, you know, in the letter saying she wanted him to take over. But not for the long run. She did see her own children, particularly Bilal as the future. I think she did see Bilal as the future, but thought he was too young at that time. He was still at Oxford University and she just didn't think he was ready. Uh, so she knew she was going back, probably, you know, possibly to her death, quite you know, likely to her death. Uh, so she knew she had to make arrangements for the next uh, succession. And she apparently people who were close to her just as she was leaving America said uh, she had decided that Blau was too young to do it at that point. So she made this arrangement where um, in a way there was a shared leadership until until um, he was ready. And how do you assess his chances in the in the future, Owen? I mean, his interest as well as his aptitude, and um, and, and his chances of of following in the footsteps of mother and grandfather, and great grandfather who ran the state of Virginia. So, in a sense, it's a fourth generation. Uh, he, he he, in a way, is in quite. You know, I, I think it is possible that he will become the next generation to do it, because. Uh, he is, first of all, he wants it. He's out doing the rallies. He's out doing the politics. He's out doing the campaigning. Uh, secondly, he is being quite tactical. He's not being as critical of the army as other members of the opposition are, Mariam Nawaz. So he is positioning himself quite well. He's young. I think the army think he's young. But they are obviously the ones who will make the decision on whether they're going to work with them or not. And we've swore, we've seen he looks like he might be willing to make the adjustments to to do it, to do to, to come to some arrangement uh, about that, which his mother did before and his father did, uh, grandfather did before that. And yeah. his great grandfather did with the British, actually. So mm. so it is, it is, I think, not impossible that uh, he will succeed in keeping the dynasty going. Yeah, you, you write in the book, if the past is a guide, then the most important factors in determining Bilal's future will be his relationships with the West and with the army. I'm going to turn to this related question on Bilal from Iram Hashmi, who says, what is your view on um, on Hassan, as in Bilal's role in Pakistani politics? Is he doing a good job in taking his mother's positive energy forward or is he merely a puppet? Well, I don't think he's a puppet. I mean, he's a, he's a young man and he's, he's out campaigning. He's expressing many of the values that his mother held dear. He's taking liberal positions on a number of issues. So to that extent, he is continuing the uh, dynastic tradition in terms of the political positions which are associated with the family. Uh, it's pretty clear now he wants it. Uh, and, you know, he's working hard to get it. I want to see if I, we can bring in some questions in person. I think we are going to be able to do this. Let me see if we can bring in um, Professor Indra de Soysa. Professor? Ah, yes. You yeah. Are yeah, hi. Thank you for having me. And uh, uh, I look forward to getting a copy of your book and reading it. But I have a very general question. Uh, I am from South Asia, from Sri Lanka. And uh, we have the very curious phenomena in South, South Asian democracies of being rather patriarchal societies, but at the same time uh, electing women, albeit famous women, uh, or perhaps famous men, uh, daughters and, and wives of famous men. But do you think there's something more than that? Are women in South Asia better articulators of particular kinds of politics that are popular are they more are, in other words are they more credible politicians are they more credible, credible politicians are they more credible as leaders yes because my 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 question comes from the fact that people always say yes south asia has these women in politics 
but they are all wives or daughters of famous men. But my point sometimes has been, yes, but they've run against famous men themselves and won, right? So being sort yes. of patriarchal in general, why do these women get elected? Well, they're, they're not alone, and, and I mean, there are many. You know, there is there are other examples of women in Pakistani public life who who have become, you know, very very prominent. Asma Jahanke being the obvious example, and uh, you know, and, and and cutting through uh, to significant support in Pakistani society. So it is an element of uh, Pakistani society, and as I don't know. Uh, Sri Lanka as well, or, or other places as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is difficult to imagine that a Benazir Bhutto could have existed without having come from the family, to be honest. I can't see how she would have managed to control, you know, found a party, found a whole system. We've seen Imran Khan do it. Uh, it's, it's, it's taken him an awful long time, and he's had a lot of celebrity power mm -hmm. behind him and so on to create a new dynasty. But, or, I'm not saying it's a dynasty, but, but a new political force, a new political structure, if you like. So, so I, I'm not sure she'd been able to do that, but it certainly is true that once she'd done it, she, she, she had a genuine popular base. Uh, and once she'd broken through, she, 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 she wasn't a, you know, the creation of her father by the time she finished her career. She was her own woman. Yeah, it. She definitely saw herself in a in a sort of tradition uh, in South Asia. I think she talked about the Bandaranaikas and, of course, the um, the Nehru Gandhis in India. I wondered though, Owen. I mean, obviously, you've got Sheikh Hasina in, in Bangladesh, but whether the moment for um, for that tradition is is petering out. I mean, particularly if you look at Congress and the uh, and the Gandhis at the moment. Well, you would you would think so, yes. But I must say, I mean, that, Bilal does seem to be showing that it may be possible to keep it going. But I, in general terms, uh, when you see what Modi has done in India and the huge base he's built up by partly by being a self-made person coming from absolutely nothing, a tea boy, uh, to prime minister, that does have resonance clearly, and it has relevance, frankly, for. Uh, these societies and the strength of the feudals in Pakistan is astonishing that it is still there. The land reform has never been seriously tackled. I mean, it has been land reform, but nothing on the scale of uh, India or other countries. And so this class, this elite class, it still exists. It still has power in rural areas. It's not just the Bhutto family. There are many other families who wield astonishing amounts of power. Uh, and it, yeah, how sustainable is that? The feudals are losing their influence slowly. And you would think that this Bhutto family dynastic setup would would if, you know, become outmoded eventually, but it may be that he can keep it going for a generation. Yeah, and actually, it's, it that that um, point about the feudal system you touch on that in in the book, um, or you reflect on it, particularly Bhutto's own relationship with you know being someone who was um, outwardly pushing for land reform at the same time as being a big landowner himself. Yes, I mean, how much land they gave up is not clear. They did give up land. It wasn't a you know totally paper exercise. So the family dig up land, but they remained you know, large landowners uh, relatively in in Sindh. So the the, the whole question of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto socialism is is quite interesting. He came to power uh, with this socialist idea. It actually came a lot of it, the ideas came from Paris and the uh, what had happened in Paris in the 60s. And his uh, the Pakistani ambassador there became a big PPP ideologue and took a lot of these ideas to Zulfikar, who could see their appeal. And he used those ideas, got to power with them, and, and then you know kept the slogans going. But I think many of his uh, more left wing supporters believe that he never really delivered in the way that they hoped. I'm going to bring in um, one comment and then I'm going to turn to Sahara Askari to ask her question in person. So this is the comment first, Owen. Um, why you think um, that a supporter or this person says a so-called supporter of democracy, um, they're referring to Bin Azir, didn't support a democratic process in her own party? Both at the start of her political career and in the will. Why? Well, yes. Well, I mean, you were, she gave an answer to that. Her answer was that if she opened up the, the party to internal party elections, that the army would manipulate the results, and she would lose influence in the party, and she'd lose control of the party. Uh, but you know, I think it is the case that the 
PPP always has been a, a Bhutto family possession, basically. And that Zulfikari Bhutto, when he started it on that founding meeting in Lahore, he did not uh, allow any internal party elections. All decisions were going to be taken by him. And, and it's been like that ever since. And so the family want control. Uh, they've kept control. And it is not an internally democratic organisation. Seher Askari, can we bring up Seher to ask her question in person? Yes, hello, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hang on, I think we need to unmute you first, Seher. Hang on a second. I apologise. Oh. Hi, oh. good evening. Okay. Hi, Owen. Okay. Hi, Hi, Michelle. Uh, I, um, I know this is a little bit off point. I mean, we talk a lot about the politics and the economics of the region. Um, I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts on civil service reform and how you feel about the lack of continuity or, should I say, the revolving door of sort of civil service leaders in Pakistan. I mean, it is clearly affecting the ability of uh, the establishment and, and of governments to sort of execute their agendas and, and ultimately having a knock-on effect um, on sort of healthcare, education, the power and energy sectors. Yeah, so just to be clear, you're talking about the power of the bureaucrats to, to, to be a block on reform. Yes, sorry, Owen. I, I think so I got, cut off there. Back to the yeah. uh, yes, well, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, it's because many of the arguments Zulfa Karani Bhutto used to uh, really disrupt the senior civil service, which he did. Uh, I mean, quite recklessly almost. I mean, he, he got rid of yes. a huge number of people and put loyalists in their place. Uh, he, he used the same arguments that were used in London, actually, about the establishment being represented by these senior civil servants and that they were all stuck in their ways. They were a block on reform. And certainly under Zorfa Bhutto, I think when he did that, he actually he lost a lot of people he needed because Pakistan didn't have many institutions. The civil service did have an elite core that actually was quite competent. Uh, and it was... They were all then dismissed. Uh, so since then, you know, I, I, the civil service is widely criticised in, in Pakistan. It, it, it is difficult to know to yes. what extent that is legitimate and to what, what extent it is the failure of political leadership uh, to, you know, tell these people what to do and to, 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 to take charge of their ministries. I'm not sure many ministers really are very effective in pushing through policy. But I, 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 I would sympathise with a minister if... They had a clear plan and it wasn't implemented. I think often they don't have a clear plan. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, oh, and I'm just keen to know, if I remember rightly, when you became a correspondent in Pakistan, I mean, you, uh, you, you were pretty new to the country, weren't you? And you've been a foreign correspondent in, in lots of other places as well. But your connection with Pakistan has grown and grown over the years, you know, more and more, even since you left. Why is it that you think this country ended up being such a big part of your professional life later? Oh, I just love going there. And people are so um, so helpful and so kind. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful place to visit. And I find the politics totally fascinating. And also, I must say, it, it, it's, it's very easy to cover Pakistan because everyone's so talkative and they're very, very indiscreet. And, and people do um, tell you what's happening, which is actually you know, delightful. I, I, I went to uh, Vietnam afterwards, where not a single Vietnamese official would ever talk to me, minister, nobody. And it was actually hopeless. And it was just like being in a, in a monastery, you know, just nothing, nothing happening. Whereas in Pakistan, there's um, you know, lots of lots of astonishingly friendly people who are very engaged in politics. And another aspect which appeals to me is it all matters so much. You know, there's so much at stake in Pakistan for young people's lives. The future of the country could be in many different directions. There's a lot to fight for. And people do fight for it. And they are charming as they do so. So I couldn't ask for more. I do remember visiting you and your family in Hanoi and seeing you in the setting of that very different context. And I was in Singapore at the time, which is absolutely the kind of place where you came out with a microphone in the street, tried to do some box box, and people would actively run away from the microphone and the camera rather, you know, it was impossible to do mm. even very, very simple things in the street. Um, let me ask you, we've got time for a few more questions, which I will get to, but what was the thing that surprised you the most with everything that you already knew about the Bhutto from that time? What really surprised you in the process of writing the book? Mm. Um, I didn't know much about the colonial stuff, and 
I didn't realise how violent that was until quite recently. I didn't realise a lot about it because it's difficult to get much on it. But it was clear that they they were fighting, you know, for, physically for stuff. Let's you mean say, the Porto? Sorry, the we should 18th, probably. Uh, hmm? Sorry. We, we, we should probably explain because I think just like you won't have known, other people won't. So the Butos yeah. were fighting. So, so, so what I'm saying is that uh, when the Butos arrived in Sindh, uh, they established themselves and were there. It's not clear when exactly they arrived, but let's say the 1700s, something like that. And, and then they did have to struggle quite hard to, to get and keep their land. And uh, that went on till about, let's say, the 1840s, 50s, which is later than I would have expected where they were you know, facing hostile people around them and they had to defend themselves from that. Uh, and maybe were on the front foot, I don't know. Because uh, it's very hard to get evidence about it. So that was quite surprising to me, how that uh, struggle was there. And, and, and then they became established and there was no need to use those kind of tactics, at least not so, so, so often. Uh, so I guess that was a surprise. I mean, the, the other thing that I wanted to learn about in writing the book was to make an assessment of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, because I didn't know a lot about it. And so I was able to read absolutely everything there was about him and to talk to people who'd worked with him and so on. And I hadn't realised how he, his hu hubris towards the end really cost him. You know, he, he was obviously a totally brilliant man in the 60s and w when he was coming to power. And, and then in 71, he, he totally delivered for Pakistan after the catastrophe of Bangladesh. He, he, he did have the scale of character, if you like, to hold the country together at that moment. And it was a significant political achievement. Uh, but then having done that, his, his, um, his intolerance of criticism and his... Uh, his, his vengefulness did, did hurt him. And by the time he needed support towards the end, it just wasn't there. Um, and he, you, you, you write about how he used flattery a lot, didn't he? Particularly with a you plan. I mean, on his, way up. on his way up. But then he was also very susceptible to it. And that was a big part of how Zell had managed to, you know, never be seen by him as any kind of threat. Uh, so yes, on the way up, he was he you know it was, he was very, he flattered Ayub Khan enormously, saying he was the best thing ever and the greatest ever leader and so on. Uh, so yes, I mean he he and also with Mirza, he used those same he used he wrote a letter saying you'll be met, better remembered than even Jinnah and so on. So in totally flattering these guys, he needed to get him on the way up. But then uh, by the end, the tragedy was in a way that when people flattered him, he didn't see what it was. And 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 he he preferred it seemed these people who were expressed loyalty and praise and so on rather than some of the hardcore PPP ideologues and strategists who'd got him to power who were genuine substantial people who had real ideas properly read well you know, intellectuals who who had a lot to offer and uh, he, he found them by the end too tricky and preferred the sycophants. Uh, your mention of 1971 has led to this um, from Bukhar Khan. Do you think that Mr. Bhutto's refusal to accept the majority mandate from East Pakistan, this is in relation to those elections um, fought uh, with Mujibur Rahman, was a catalyst in the creation of Bangladesh? I think there was a lot to it. And it's a bit difficult to pin it down to that one event, although that was certainly an important event and it did play its part in the process. But my take on it in the end, was um, that he probably never realised, this is what, uh, what one of those who was close to him at the time said, and it was quite an interesting insight, that he never quite realised how serious it was. And that he thought it would be fine and that Pakistan would remain united. So it was, it was surprising for a man who was so good at reading politics, seeing strategy, you know, spotting China as the coming power, this kind of thing. He, he, he got a lot of things right, but he, he did not get that right. And he apparently just never understood what was happening quite so that when which is again maybe west pakistani arrogance in a sense uh, and, and and when it happened uh, you know he had not really done anything to help prevent it happening so i think you know to that extent he he he's you know he's one of those who was involved in that in that in that, in that process yes i'm going to turn to one more uh, question in person uh, which is raza afandi Hello, hi good evening both of you um, and um, good evening, Owen. Uh, you may have already answered this partially uh, earlier on, but as a journalist, um, when you were covering the country, which aspects of Pakistan and Pakistani culture were you most fascinated and enthralled by? 
Oh, well, I suppose it's the struggle for power, really. I mean, it's just raw politics, isn't it? And, and um, you know, there are so many people competing for power from nationalists in, in the provinces to the religious uh, element to the mainstream parties. Uh, and then at rural level, these feudal guys and these tribal leaders. So there are so many people uh, competing in very sophisticated ways. I mean, as well as with astonishing levels of violence, I have to say, and, and you know, a, a, a absurdly rapid recourse to violence. But there is also a lot of very highly sophisticated politics going on and subtle politics. And it's just, you know, to me, a totally fascinating place to see. And, and some of it, I mean, when I saw Benazir Bhutto down in Lakana, um, but it's been sort of 99 or something like that. And, and she, she had this amazing scene where she was almost on a throne, surrounded by courtiers. Uh, and then the front row were her ambassadors and ministers. And then as she went back, the sort of uh, just villagers at the back. And I, I just thought it was a scene out of something you know, from centuries ago. You know, it's just an astonishing thing to, to witness. And, and then from that to these people who are dealing in nuclear politics in Washington. You know, so it, 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 there is an awful lot going on in Pakistani politics. Thank you, brother. I'm going to actually I'm quite intrigued by this question, Owen, and I'm, I'm, it would be good to get your take on it. What would Benazir Bhutto's wishes or aspirations for her daughters, Bakhtava and Asifa? This is a good question. I mean, I, 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 on that trip, actually, in 1999, I did see Benazir proudly. Um, sorry, I've got problems, problems with my camera angles. So, uh, I did notice her, her, her um, proudly showing me taking Bakhtar to a school that she was in charge of in some way, despite being very young herself. I mean, it was quite an odd situation. But she obviously did want her children to be engaged in Pakistan. She said that having brought them up in Dubai was a problem. Uh, and that you know she was worried about their connection to the country, but that you know that in a way has been resolved, doesn't it? I mean they're totally involved in Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, and they're still there and they're very active. But do you think that she believed, as a mother of a son and two daughters, do you think she believed that the inheritance, in this case being the party, was the sons primarily? I, I, I mean I guess it'd be a bit unfair to say that in that when 2007 came, they were quite young, the girls. Mm -hmm. So I guess it would have been obvious for her to be thinking in terms of the elder son. I mean, it would be highly ironic if she did think that because she fought she fought against her own mother. I mean, complained about her own mother. She said, always said that it was her father who had supported her as a woman to become an independent person more than her mother. And so as a mother, one can only hope she was consistent. Okay, I'm gonna show everyone your book one more time. There it is, Owen, congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you've shared with us this evening. And I'm going to hand back to um, Salman now to, to close the event. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michelle and Owen. That was a fascinating discussion. And, 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 and I think I personally learned a lot. And it was great to hear from Owen in terms of his, uh, uh, his observations on Pakistani politics and, and culture as well. I guess both things are completely interrelated. Um, so thank you very much to everyone who has been tuning in and, and supporting TCF for your questions as well. Uh, as I mentioned, um, you can uh, donate through the QR button uh, you see on your uh, screens and, 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 and other ways as well. But before I wrap up, I would like to uh, offer our deepest condolences. Uh, in fact, uh, Rash Rashid Abdullah, who was one of the co-founders of TCF, unfortunately passed away uh, on the 22nd of November. Uh, he was uh, the, uh, the first uh, chairman of the board and also played a key role in setting up the first five schools. Uh, and his belief was that no child should go without education because of poverty and discrimination. Uh, so it's a very strong legacy he leaves and, and, and of course a huge loss for the TCF uh, community and, 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 and the supporters. So deepest condolences uh, from our end uh, uh, to, to, to TCF and, and, and the wider community. It's a, uh, it's a truly a big loss, uh, especially of people of that stature who have been doing so much uh, to, to solve and, or at least try to solve 
the crisis which faces Pakistan. So, uh, and I'm going to just uh, wrap up by saying that if you want to donate, just to highlight that between 29th of November and the 1st of December, there is a matching campaign going on. Uh, so anything you donate uh, up to 180,000 pounds will be matched and your uh, a donation will be doubled. So, uh, so please uh, keep that in mind as you support uh, TCF. And, and it's goodbye from all of us here. And thank you very much for your time and, 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 and your continued support. So thanks a lot. And thanks once again, a big thank you to Michelle and Owen for their time and, and, and their insights. Bye-bye.